you. I have a very picturesque address and a very picturesque place here in Birdsong Lane. That's a marvelous place to live, isn't it? <laughs> yes, uh, I. Uh, we both like it very much. Sort of quiet pocket in a not very quiet world. world. It uh, is a far cry from your noonday friends in some ways, and yet uh, basically these children have a calmness maybe that would come in a place like this. We enjoyed your noonday friends immensely because one thing is when uh, you have Fanny and Simone talk, it's just like we talk. How do you get this to sound so real? I have been asked that uh, in our family, my two sisters and I, we have among us eight boys and one girl. And frequently people have asked me how I can write about girls, as uh, they say as poignantly. Yes. And I have to remind them I was a girl <laughs> myself. And I have very good recall. I have almost total recall. And uh, obviously I think anyone who writes for children would have to have a deep, never failing feeling of closeness for children. I find them... Not only enormously important, I, I find them endlessly fascinating. I, I, I love to be in the presence of children, and I am. I make Now my own children are grown, but I make occasions with my friends and everyone to be among children as much as I can. And in addition, as I say, I have this gift of total recall, which is going to make me a joy to the friends of my old age. Is Franny a real girl that you knew? Well, this is a question that's always asked, and I have never been able to find an answer for it. Yes. Any character in any book is true. It's, it's somebody real and and someone made up. And you cannot you say how much of her is real and how much is made up. Everything's true and everything's not true. It's a company. Yes. Yeah. But she is not really any uh, little girl that you know that you've no, been No, I've never done with. that. I've never taken any. I Oh, I, I should say in one instance that's not so. Uh, in the I wrote these two books about Barton Street, the dog on Barton Street and the bully of Barton Street. And my son, Bill, years and years ago, had a great deal of trouble with a big bully down the street. And I more or less faced that boy, the bully, on that very real young man that I had a lot of trouble with. Too. Then how about the story of the Noonday Friends? Is there any of this that's true? Again, I have to say no. Uh, it's only true in the sense that I grew up in New York myself and... Not in the circumstances these children were in, but it's a, it's a feeling for people who are poor, children who lack things. And yet, in this family, of course, there was love. Which is the number one item. I believe it. And I think it was in that family, you know, as it was in the other little book I wrote about two little girls in New York called A Wonderful Sweet. Terrible Oh, yes. We, this is one we're going to talk about in a minute. But I am unable apparently, to write a book without a loving family relationship. I realize that there are many, many family relationships that are not loving. I don't seem to be able to deal with them. But this is very reassuring for young people to read. Really. Possibly it's reassuring, but I also think that since the other is so real and so present in so many children's lives, maybe it'd be a good thing to write about that, too. Now, the bully in the, in the book did not get along very well with his parents. I mean, I recognize the fact that there are areas where children don't get along with their parents. You said you did live in New York City, but you did not live in Greenwich Village then. No. Uh, no. Um, but you were well acquainted, apparently. Oh, yes, I know Greenwich Village very well. Now, Mr. Horney is not patterned after a real person then either. No one is. You, you begin a book, and you have a few central characters of family. You have a locale. And then my method is uh, simply to start writing. I find one word follows another word. I really do not know, and I never have known, when I start a book, where the book is going. So I have you know no plot outlines and uh, no very clear idea of what's going to happen. And that's in the way of incidents. Uh, I knew I wanted to write about a relationship of children in a poor neighborhood. And the burden that, that a girl in that position would have imposed on her of, of having to take care of a, of a little brother, you know, of having so little time to be a child which is what was true with Franny. I mean, she didn't, really didn't have much time to be a little girl. Did you uh, make a scrapbook when you were a girl? A yes, like, uh, yes. I think all proper little girls make scrapbooks. I'm convinced. That. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I certainly did. I had a very ambitious scrapbook. Uh, Mine was mostly filled with animals. 
Do you still have the scrapbooker? No, I'm, I'm not a saver. We like the whole family, and Marshall in particular. And his birthday presents were particularly good, and particularly that ticket. How did you think of this? Well, uh, again, it's, you know, you sit and you, you're you there in a room with a typewriter and yourself and no one there, and you have all these characters who really are very alive, and they are, when you begin to write, if you really care about the book. If you don't, you discard it, and I have discarded books. But these children and the parents were very real to me, and I wanted them, to, that child, to have something very nice for his birthday, but clearly it couldn't be something very nice that was bought with money. Mm-hmm. And I, this was an imaginative father, and I'm a... I'm imaginative, <laughs> and I tried to think, now what could you do for a child if you didn't have money? And I suddenly re- remembered, this is, you know, my recall coming in, and anyway, all the children. I know that all children would like to stay up all night. It's, it's something that children <laughs> love to do. I don't know very many children who've made it through the night. I wanted to stay up all night many, many times when I was a child. I don't know that I ever managed, but... Uh, it just seemed like a very nice idea. And then the ticket, I don't know how I filled the ticket, but I must say I was enchanted when I did. Now, in the wonderful, terrible time, we wondered about the title until we had read quite a ways. And then we realized that both the girls had a wonderful time and a terrible time, too, didn't they? Yes, well, the title was meant to mystify. <laughs> it does. <laughs> you have said, then, that Mady and Sue Ellen were not uh, children that you knew. Again, these are children of your imagination. Yes, but... Uh, as I say, I, I what it is in me that, that requires me to write backgrounds that are loving, I don't know. I haven't analyzed that. But um, there are obviously many, many Negro families as white families who are loving, who give stability to their children. The children grow up in that kind of atmosphere just as there is the other. And uh, this is the one I wrote about once again. We like the story particularly because it was about things that are happening that we hear about in the news. Now, before, we never knew anybody that got killed, like Mady's father did in the civil rights fight, and it made it seem uh, more like this was really happening. Oh, yes. It's uh, it's happening, and I I feel very much that children, well, I don't like pejoratives, I don't want to say should read, but I think they want to read about what's real around them. Yes, well, the statement that they said they had never known anybody uh, before. Now now they feel as if they know someone who mm-hmm. got killed in the civil rights. When you were a girl, did you go to camp? Oh, yes. Yes, I went to camp. Loved uh, it. Did you have a secret place? like you I had camp? a secret place. Now, that's one true thing that I have in a book. I had a secret place exactly as described in that book. And I never, until I wrote the book, never mentioned it. No, I told my mother about it, but I never mentioned it to anyone else. But that is exactly described, and the feelings that child had in that secret place were precisely my feelings that I had then. I loved camp. I I love animals. And you see, I grew up in New York, and uh, being in the country to me, many, many of the children's reactions about the camp and that book were mine, definitely. It's just to be where the flowers and the animals and the smells and the moon, and I, I just loved it. No wonder you picked this place. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this house, this is a fine house for me. I mean, we're just trees everywhere and the birds. And were you ever a camp counselor? No. Did you make a terrarium like maybe did? No, my sister made a terrarium. One of my, my sister Eileen made a terrarium. In fact, Eileen is still making terrarium. Terraria. We like the pictures, but uh, we thought that the picture of Sue Ellen looked more like what we thought maybe should look like and that the picture of maybe looked more like what Sue Ellen should look like. Well, I think that's very acute of you. The artist mixed them up. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I think that's very acute of you and the children who picked that up. When he mixed them up, and when I realized what had happened, I had to reverse, because it's, it's easier for me just to reverse the printed words than for the artist to uh, change all the I pictures. I see. Well, now, this is most interesting. I think it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Now, we have read Belling the Tiger and the Great Rebellion and Siri the Conquistador, and we like them all. How did you get the idea for the stories about these two mice and their friend the cat? I really honestly Didn't can't it? answer. I don't remember. I, I love, as you've mm-hmm. gathered by now, animals of all descriptions. Particularly, I love cats. I, I just adore cats. And uh, I guess I just wanted I You know, I wrote another book called Fredo about a cat who lives yes, in Paris and owns a hotel. <laughs> Well, I just do like cats and mm-hmm. writing about them, and I, I guess I wanted to introduce, you know, a worthy foil for the cat. I guess I really started out with the two mice 
more predominant, didn't mm -hmm. I? Than the... We wondered if you had pet mice ever. Oh, yes, I had pet mice once. In fact, even to this day, I mean, a mouse is very welcome in my house. <laughs> Uh, do you have a cat? Uh, a we have a cat, but she's she's a funny cat. She catch things outside. But I have sat here while she sits there near the fireplace and watched a mouse run across the room. And she apparently thinks it's invited if it's in the house because she never goes after a mouse in the house. I don't mean we're overrun with mice no. in this house, but field mice come yeah. in. You know, those lovely little field mice. And uh, I, I just think they're enchanting. Mm -hmm. I love mice. Or from the sun porch, I could, or the oh, yes, they, can, they could get in. We had a whole little family of them out there, <laughs> of field mice, and they were just adorable. By the way, what's your cat's name? Eleanor. And it's not like Sarah. No, cat. Eleanor, for one thing, she's uh, uh, she's not a mature uh, cat, a Siri. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say it's really philosophical. <laughs> no, not as <laughs> no, Eleanor is, is a sprite. Now, in Siri the Conquistador, why did the mice think the dog was a dragon? I think it's in the text there somewhere that they think he's going to be like a dragon. They don't know what this dog is going to be like, but they feel he's going to be huge and fierce. And of course, a word, a name like Maximilian is pretty <laughs> overpoweringly intense. And I think that I thought I had it in the book, but possibly I just tried to imply that they felt it would be a dragon-like apparition. We like the dog that you picked to stay in the story. Is there another story, or is there going to be another story about Maximilian? No, I, I think I've explored that delicatessen and those mice and that cat and dog. No, I, uh, now I've, I've just finished one about a hen. You want to hear about the hen? Yes. Uh, well, it's a, a hen who finds herself the only mother left in the barnyard. So she's forced in the position of being the mother to a foal and a lot of piglets and goslings and ducklings and some kids, you know, goats, baby goats. And she, very naturally, is trying to turn them into proper chickens. And she's the mother, and she's a chicken, and they have to be chickens, too. And, you know, they are going to go off and do their own thing. So the this story is about... And actually, now I've gotten rather fond of this scatterbrained hen. And I'm thinking maybe I'll do another book about her. Now, is this the picture book? Or no, no, this, this is on the same book. idea as the, the Great Rebellion yeah. story. Yeah, mm -hmm. Oh. And, and, of uh, course, as you know, this, I, I always go back to writing about animals. Mm -hmm. like, now, would that one be out this fall, or not? Oh, no, let's see, I just turned that one in. No, we have one coming out in the fall, which is the picture book, and then one coming out in the spring called The Dragons of the Queens about Mexico. And I don't know really when the hen will be out. Well, you have to find the right artist. That's right. But from time to time, uh, you'll find that the artist you would like to have is either too busy or doesn't like the book, and they will frankly tell you so. You know, they, this is not a book that they care to illustrate. Um... So then you have to, you know, look around for the proper right artist. It must be the right artist, so the book is ruined. I mean, the, the artist is every bit as important as the writer. So uh, you can spend months for the picture book that's coming out in the fall, say something. We literally spent months before we found young Ed Crescino, and this will be his first uh, book. Right. I think he's done a beautiful job. But, but the pictures are done for that. Then, it's yes, like, it'll be out in October. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The artist in uh, the um, Ace and Rambo series, the one about the mice Benny and the cat, uh, we like his things. Oh, we, we like Benny Montresor, too. I think he's magnificent. Mm -hmm. He understood just what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. um, now, these are uh, good stories to read to our little brothers and sisters, and the pictures are good, too. You know, may I interject yes. something here? Yes, certainly. That I don't know whether anyone except me has noticed this, that each of those books ends with the mice falling asleep, which I always thought would make them good bedtime stories. All four of those books ends with the mice going to sleep. That's right. We hadn't noticed. They would make excellent uh, bedtime stories. And I noticed that quite by accident that I ended the hand book with the hand going to sleep, so apparently I want everyone to go to bed and go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to end the book. And now about this cat who owned the hotel in Paris. How do you pronounce her name? Fredou. Fredou. Here we come up, but we have another real character. See, I do have some real yeah. characters. My yeah. I lived in, in Paris, uh, oh, many years ago, in a little hotel called the Mont Blanc on the Rue de la Huchette, which is on the left bank. And there was a cat there, the most magnificent cat. And I, I do not remember what his name was. I don't know how I got the name Fredou. I don't think that cat was named Fredou. But he had the most proprietary air about the hotel. Uh, he used to sit there 
as big as the concierge. <laughs> and he would sort of accompany you sometimes to your room and look around, be sure the towels were there and everything, and then he'd go out again and say goodbye. And uh, obviously I couldn't forget a cat like that. And I was uh, just sitting around, you know, trying to think, well, what do I write next? And I thought about this cat. For I do, I, I don't know where I came up with that. I love the name. It's a fine name for a cat. My sister has named one of her cats for I do now. So I decided to go ahead and have him own the hotel. But it just came from the way he acted. Uh, yes, he did. he <laughs> certainly had a very Lord of the Manor air there. How about the elevator? Was there one uh, really there that looked like a birdcage? Oh, this was a this uh, hotel, which I think I called in the book Mulvair. It was an exact description of the hotel I lived in. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do you like cats better than dogs? Oh, I'm afraid I have to say I do. I know this isn't going to go down well with too many children, but yes, I prefer cats to dogs. I love all animals, but cats enchant me. A cat is irresistible. This wasn't answered in the story, but it was a thought that came to us. How did Aladdin feel when Paul brought the cat home, do you think? <laughs> oh, I think he would have accepted that cat and been a good little mother to it. Uh, uh, no. Papa. Um, did the people who own Thomas Seen uh, get another cat? Undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. People who own cats always get another cat. <laughs> did you uh, write as a child? Yes. Always. I, I wrote. I wrote from, I'm sure, the time I learned to write letters and words and the time I learned to read. And I learned to read early, and, and this is true of every writer I've ever met. That they all learned to read and to write early, and they all started writing immediately, as soon as they knew that this could be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you ever write poetry? As oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, as a child, as a girl, I wrote lots of poetry. Did you ever have any poetry published as a as a child uh, in some of the children's magazines? Yes, mm-hmm. yes, I did. When did you first have your stories published? Nineteen. Did you know when you were young that you wanted to write? Oh, I had had every intention of becoming a writer. I didn't know that I would write primarily for children, Mm -hmm. but I had every intention of being a writer. Uh, Now, uh, you have a picture book coming out this fall. Is this the only picture book you've ever done? Yes. It's a very, very difficult endeavor to write a good picture book, and we'll see how good mine is. But to write a good picture book, and there are quite a few, is a... Quite an accomplishment, I think. Uh, did you ever write any that weren't published, for instance, of uh, picture books? Yes, yeah. I've written approximately, I would say, close to 50 that weren't published. Oh. It's, it's always fascinated me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is interesting to see how much work goes into a thing like this. And oh, yes, don't because you see, there's no question of it. People think that this, the fewer the words, the easier the book is to write. Now, I have written every age level there is. Adults, children, I have written for all age levels. And I am here to testify that I think a novel is easier to write than a picture book. And I am not pretending it's true. Now, what subjects did you like best in school? Or subjects? Oh, English, obviously. Mm-hmm. History, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. And I like just to read. And, of course, uh, well, I'm not going to say the subjects I avoid. I don't want to set any bad examples. Uh-huh. But uh, I was actually, I, I liked school. So that uh, I, I, I got along fine in school because there was nothing I absolutely hated. <laughs> it's just that I liked English and history better. Yeah. Do you remember some of the, your favorite stories as a uh, book as a young as Oh, a yes, yes. I adored Hans Christian Andersen, I, and I still to this day can read Hans Christian Andersen. I hope children are still reading him. I still read Beatrice Potter with the greatest of pleasure. I love The Little Lame Prince. Uh, the Secret Garden. I, th- I think they do still read those. Yes. Um, oh, Alice. As as a child, you read it in one way, and then later on another. Of course, the great Wind in the Willows. Well, you have told us so much, and I'm sure we're going to enjoy your books this much more now that we know something about how they came into being. And we thank you very much for it. That's pleasing. Thank you.